the uh, speaker to whom the question is uh, directed to for any difficulties you can use the chat uh, to uh, uh, talk to the technician mrs ludmilia odud moderator for this session you have the floor Uh, it's my big pleasure to greet all of the speakers and the participants today on the session dedicated to innovative initiatives. My name is Lyudmila Odud. I'm the Omega Youth Steering Committee representative. Um, and it's a big honor for me to moderate this, this session today. Uh, I'm sure during this day you've heard that NEGA and other cities are facing facing a lot of challenges uh, on daily basis, uh, simultaneously uh, managing their environment to be healthy and safe for their inhabitants. Increasing temperatures, sea level rise, uh, population growth, urbanizations are among factors what increasing uh, water-related risks. Separate measures uh, might not be fully successful to resist the existing challenges and to predict consequences. The complex approaches, including governance, technologies, uh, education, etc., should be implemented and planned for the further future, taking into the account that promotion of nature is one of the major assets for adaptation to climate change. Uh, during this session, you will have an opportunity to learn about some examples of approaches that are directed to help cities to become uh, more resilient and also inclusive, smart and circular. I would like to introduce our first speaker for today. It's uh, Ms. Panchali Saikia. She's currently working as a program officer with the, the Water and Sanitation Department at the Stockholm International Water Institute in Sweden. She is a water governance and resilience expert managing the city water resilient approach project at CV and contributing to several ongoing studies, including a UNDP, UNICEF, CV study on water resources and uh, water services management, linkages and further initiatives on gender, indigenous people and broader water governance issues under the UNDP CV program on water governance facility. Her regional expertise expands across South, Southeast and Central Asia with extensive field experience in these regions. Uh, Ms. Panch uh, Panchali will be presenting the topic uh, City Water Resilience Approach, a five-step methodology to build water resilience at an urban scale. Um, Ms. Saikia, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Ludmila. Uh, I would request uh, the presentation slides to be put in. Uh, I'm very pleased to be part of this discussion uh, today, and uh, I would be presenting to you this paper that talks about an innovative approach to build water resilience at an urban scale, the city water resilience approach. Uh, it is a step-by-step -step process comprises of different tools and resources. And as you see here, it's a collaborative approach with different partners. Uh, and this is co-authored with my colleagues at the Stockholm International Water Institute, CV, Arup, and the Resilient Shift. Next slide, please. To briefly discuss, I would present in my presentation a conceptual background on the CWRA, uh, the principles that it's based on, the methodology used to develop it, and then introduce you to the different uh, steps of CWRA and the related tools, and then also give you some reflections uh, from the application of uh, CWRA steps and the tools in city of Cape Town and Miami. Next, next slide, please. Uh, when we talk of water resilience, resilience uh, as a terminology is, has become very common now. It's, it has started to be used as a paradigm uh, and a new model in urban uh, water management and not just water, but also in the water wider urban sector. When we talk of water resilience, the terminology is not very common when you look into literatures or the usage. Uh, it's more adapted from the existing uh, definitions and terminology that talks of resilience of water systems, or socio-ecological systems. It talks of the capacity, uh, when we talk in the context of urban, uh, the city's capacity to function uh, in general uh, in order to provide services and managing resources, but also enduring disasters. And this is not limited to climate disasters alone. Resilience also talks about the other uh, shocks and stresses the cities may face and coping and adapting to that. 
and this could also mean something around the health crisis that we are currently facing around COVID. The CWRE is actually based on uh, this five principle as is reflected here in the slide you see. It talks of the inclusive and transparent that talks of bringing different perspective from uh, different stakeholders and encouraging a collective action. A system-based approach that is uh, looking into connecting on the interdependent from cities and then we're piloted in these two cities in Cape Town and Miami. Next slide please. Now coming to the approach it's itself when I was talking about the approach it's actually comprises of uh, the five steps when I was mentioning uh, and then it includes the uh, two different tools. So what makes it a unique approach is that it does not limit itself of having an assessment tool uh, or a limiting tool. It actually comprises of a step-by-step -step process that helps in a smooth transition of use of this kind of tools. I mean, you can see there are multiple tools now that talks of benchmarking and of assessments, but what CWRA offers is for cities to come up with a step-by-step -step process to use the tools and build uh, and assess their city's resilience capacity and also move beyond that assessment. I'll take you through each of those steps in a while. Next slide, please. Here you will see the first step when I talk of in the five step approach is the understanding the urban water system. This is very crucial before any assessment is conducted, before a city conducts an assessment, how it is doing in the current city scenario of resilience, it's important that it sit back and look into its city's water systems, understand what are the shocks and stresses it's faced, and also defining the basin in terms of where the city depends. Uh, can you click the next? Yes. When you look into this diagram, it talks of when we look into cities, urban sector, um, it can be influenced by various other uh, uh, aspects. For example, the urban water sector, any decision made in the urban water sector can influence other urban systems, for example, food, transportation, uh, industry, communication, and, and other energy industries. So it could actually influence, and it could be also influenced by those decisions taken in those sectors. So it's important to understand that before building any resilient strategy and action plan for the urban water sector, it's important to understand this interdependent connectivity. And that is where comes the influencing sphere, where you see in the second layer is the uh, influencing sphere where we talk of not just the urban water sector, but looking beyond the urban water sector. And this is not limited to other urban sectors. It could be beyond the city's capacities and looking into other governance labor, uh, layers that could go beyond to the provincial level in some countries and to the national level. And this becomes really crucial to understand and engage with who are the stakeholders one needs to engage while developing uh, this kind of resilient strategies at urban water sector. Next slide, please. So towards this, a, a digital tool has been developed that helps in system mapping and uh, as the first step of before conducting any assessment and also understanding how the stakeholder relationship are. I will take you through this digital tool in a while, showing the examples for both Cape Town and Miami in a while. But before that, let me go to the second step. Next slide. The city water resilience assessment. This is a very crucial one and now like, like I was mentioning, this has become a very important aspect when we are trying to identify any gaps in any sector, doing an analysis, a diagnosis. This is crucial. 
And the urban water sector, when we talk of understanding the system feeds into um, this uh, framework when we, it was developed, it's represented as, as a wheel. Uh, next, please. And that touch upon different dimensions, which are the different layers uh, 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 that frames the framework. This is the leadership and strategy, infrastructure and ecosystem, health and well being, and uh, planning and finance. This is important because limiting to only understanding, for example, nature based solutions and looking into just uh, the infrastructure related aspect will not help a city to build resilience, but also looking into wider human and health being and the public value and also the governance aspect around planning the leaderships in the city that helps in framing this aspect is important in the analysis. Next slide, please. The framework itself, the wheel that you saw comprises of the dimension and each of the dimension consists of a specific goal that the city needs to achieve. For example, the leadership and strategy, you can see we have uh, specific goals around basin connected governance, uh, lead, uh, more looking into the strategic vision that city needs to build. Those are some of the goals that uh, forms the layer. The more important aspect is the indicators that has been developed for the framework that help the cities to assess their resilience capacities. In a multi-stakeholder workshop, cities can, um, diverse stakeholders can gather and kind of use these indicators to assess the different dimensions that I had mentioned above. So there is a scale, next please. The scale of scoring these indicators from optimal to poor, looking into how the city is doing in the current scenarios. And after this assessment is done, a gaps can be identified based on the indicators that has been scored low. Next, please. After this assessment workshop, uh, the problems and uh, the indicators that are scored low has been evaluated in a core group that can use in terms of identifying the problem statement, which is again taken forward with the city stakeholders to come up with the solutions. A specific methodology has been developed for taking this problems a statement forward in terms of identifying the interventions or actions that can help resolve and come up as a solutions to uh, address these problems. And that is where we are after the assessment workshop, a visioning workshop is conducted with the cities in order to identify uh, the solutions. And, and this takes a, a different methodology that looks into the root causes of the problem, identifying the opportunities within the city, if there are existing programs that helps in uh, integrating some of those um, action that has been identified to prioritizing some of the key actions from the cities. Now, can you move to the next slide, please? Now from this uh, assessment workshop and defining the action plan, it does not limit in terms of just coming up with the actions and identifying, but also moving beyond that. Like after one uh, city identifies the actions that needs to improve the city resilience uh, in the water sector, one needs to also look into the implementation of the actions, right? And towards that, it's very important the implementations, uh, the resilient champions that I was mentioning in the initial first step takes a very lead role here in terms of dissemination of the information from the visioning and assessment workshop to the wider uh, stakeholders uh, in the city. And in terms of having an implementation strategy to ensure that the objectives of the resilience uh, uh, in the understanding uh, that was preliminarily done uh, before the assessment that what the city is trying to achieve uh, needs to be maintained and that the resources for implementing those uh, activities are secured and are used efficiently. So it's very important this uh, four and fifth step of CWRA is crucial in terms of understanding beyond this uh, assessment and moving towards implementations monitoring that helps the cities to maintain and sustain that resilience capacities. Now going to the application itself, uh, I'll show some examples of um, uh, from the Cape Town and Miami. Next, next step, please. Here you will see when I was mentioning about the first step, the understanding of the system, where I was talking about the digital tool. Uh, I don't know if it's quite clear here, but this digital tool helps in terms of visualizing the water systems where the water sources are mapped, uh, the infrastructures like dams are uh, identified how it's linked to the different water sources to aquifers, how it links, the distribution channel, the water treatment plants, the users. So it gives a visual diagram of the whole urban water systems and how the catch catchments are connected. Like for example, in Cape Town, um, majority of the water for the city of Cape Town comes from the catchment that is beyond the control uh, of the city. It comes from, uh, it forms as a system that is uh, controlled by the uh, National Water and Sanitation Department. So it's kind of very, um, crucial that uh, the city of Cape Town has this Western Cape uh, water supply system, 
which forms like almost like a 14 dams that comprises of the sources. And three of the dams are actually managed uh, and owned by the National Department of Water and Sanitation, which is beyond the control of the city of Cape Town. So it's important that this whole catchment uh, and how the sources and infrastructure users in the city are connected, uh, it's crucial. And then the other feature in the, uh, in the tool is filtering in terms of shocks and stresses. For example, a drought impacting city of Cape Town, how will it impact in, uh, the different assets in the system uh, helps to identify, okay, these are the crucial assets that get impacted by drought or maybe by flood in the city. So it's, it's kind of a visual impact that helps uh, the city to understand their system and how the different assets are connected. And also the stakeholders, the stakeholders can be defined for each of the assets, who are the financer, who are the regulator, who are the manager, the user for those assets are defined. Next slide, please which helps in building the stakeholder relationship in the second component. Uh, here you see an example of, from Miami. Uh, you see the Miami-Dade County, how it's connected to different stakeholders in the city or at the national level in terms of uh, the assets that it's responsible in the urban water system. So this kind of connection that you see here helps to uh, identify which stakeholders Miami-Dade County needs to uh, really engage with in terms of building the strategies uh, of resilience uh, for the city. So this is very crucial and this uh, our water digital tool can be implemented independent of the city water resilience approach. It helps facilitate in terms of the cities to understand their urban water system. So it has been used as a resource to facilitate the steps from understanding to and then moving into assessment because you understand how the assets are getting impacted, who are the stakeholder responsible. So then you can invite those stakeholders for the discussion and assessing those indicators uh, for the city water resilience assessment framework, uh, which brings to the results. Next slide, please. Ms. Panchari? Yes. Can uh, please uh, come yes. closer to the conclusions? Yes, yeah, just here you see the visual from, uh, next slide, please. And showing some example from Miami. These were the indicators uh, uh, assessment workshops, which used to scoring the indicators uh, that I had talked about initially, where some of the uh, issues and problems that were identified here, you see, I'll just take up one example because of the time limitation. Institutionalizing resilience was one of the key aspects that was discussed because resilience is not uh, uncommon in uh, Miami. It's, it's very well, the city leadership talks about building resilience. What was talked about is operationalizing and integrating into policy. So there were a lot of solutions on the opportunities column here, you will see solutions that were identified uh, by the cities. Next slide, please. In my conclusion, I, I would like to talk about that uh, with this uh, application in city of Cape Town and Miami, uh, this water resilience profile uh, reports were created, which talks, talks about what was the problems and what are the actions identified. And the cities, both the cities acknowledged that these were some of the very crucial resources useful in terms of the existing strategies. For example, in Miami, the resilient 305 strategy found it very useful in terms of integrating the water action plans into their resilience strategies. Even for Cape Town, the newly launched water strategies, uh, the Cape Town stakeholders and city leadership acknowledge that this kind of inputs will be very in useful in terms of the implementation of the strategy of uh, the city's uh, uh, water strategy in forward from, from this assessment that was done. Uh, I mean, I would conclude here saying that this approach and tools could be implemented in any cities or at the town level. And it would be very interested to see some of um, the interest from you uh, if there is any interest and there will be a required dedication in terms of resources uh, and, and in terms of uh, dedicated staff to be able to implement the whole process and sustain it. Thank you so much for listening to me. Looking forward to the questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Saikia, um, for your presentation. I hope to see uh, in the close future uh, a more successful implementation of your framework in uh, low-income countries, too. And uh, we are moving to the next speaker. It's Ms. Khalid Ashley. Uh, she's General Policy Analyst at Water Governance and Circular Economy Unit in the Cities, Urban Policies and Sustainable Development Division of the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, SMEs, Regions and Cities. 
Calif uh, researches and uh, analyzes topics including water-related risks such as floods, sea level rise in urban areas and uh, is in the process of developing discussion paper around impact indicators for water governance. Uh, she helps with the organization and preparation of high-level meetings, interviews and policy dialogues. Uh, she also have, has rich uh, experience as an environmental consultant across the US Canada and Europe. Um, today she will be presenting on the topic uh, Thinking Cities, what economic and governance conditions lead to greater resilience. Uh, Ms. Ashley, please, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're connected from. Um, my name is Colette Ashley and I am thrilled and honored to be here as um, a policy analyst at the OECD Water Governance Program. Um, the OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and it is an international organization that works to build um, better policies for better lives. There are 37 member countries, and we work to support countries in different levels of their government to recommend and implement policies. The OECD Water Governance Program um, has conducted many country level analyses of water reform, such as in Brazil, the Netherlands, Argentina, and more during the past 10 years of the program. We have also uh, worked under a specific thematics such as floods, stakeholder engagement, and cities. And um, as shown here, we have also collaborated with other experts in our division, which is um, the city's urban policies and sustainable, sustainable development division. Um, on sustainable development, green growth, and land use. Uh, and so we work to help countries achieve better water security and access to services through water governance, which serves as a means to an end. Um, the 12 OECD principles on water governance were adopted in 2015 and act as standards for water governance. Since then, we have been working to help countries, governments, cities, and basins implement the principles. Um, and about this work, in the past, um, the issue of sinking was solved from a sectoral point of view and water governance and land use were treated separately and the link between them was not obvious. So we wanted to do this research to contribute to something that we could not find in the literature. If I can go to the next slide, please. Um, to start off, these risks and drivers were found to have a massive impact on cities. The work on sinking is intensified by these megatrends mega that will affect cities in the near future. Cities can only develop sustainably, sustainably if they provide reliable water and sanitation services to city dwellers and manage the risk of too much water through floods, um, too little water through droughts, and too polluted water. The drivers will have an impact on these risks. The solutions to these risks involve the integration of policies, as previously mentioned, between land use, water governance, and also urban policy. Then innovation, but not only from a technical point of view, but also institutional and social innovation. In terms of investment, um, it is important to note that it is not just about the quantity of money or investments, but also about how to properly allocate funding and diversify sources of funding. Um, more than 70% of the consequences of climate change manifest themselves in the water sector. These consequences are expected to accelerate the pace of change with the most severe impacts expected in the second half of the 21st century. Proper use of resources with circularity and ensuring safe and clean water access, especially in terms of the current COVID-19 crisis, will become increasingly important to issues and to work towards resilience. If I could go to the next slide, please. Um, and so as, as identified in our paper, there is not one clear cut definition of a sinking city. However, there are many definitions of sinking. So sinking signifies a city that has begun and continues to lose elevation, making it at, at or below sea level over time. So it's not one issue of vulnerability, but often concerns a combination of sea level rise flood risk and land subsidence, a factor that further exposes cities to more frequent and more severe water-related disasters. Sinking can occur through the combined effects of climate change in terms of sea level rise, increasing frequency of extreme precipitation, and increasing intensity of hurricanes, all which drive 
and increased flood risk. There are natural and anthropogenic causes as identified in this slide. And um, we found this evidence from the literature review, but we also uh, conducted interviews with cities. Um, city officials, uh, they highlighted what the cities currently have in place in terms of a plan for resilience and climate change, focusing on the impact on water security, the effects of water related risks and the links with land use policy. The responses are based on, uh, so one, uh, spatial planning, two, green infrastructure, and three, um, more ex ante investment in mitig mitigation and prevention through payment for ecosystem services, robust insurance systems, and co-finance schemes. Many um, Asia Pacific Delta cities are subject to these problems due to their geographical location and their rapid urbanization and population growth. <clears throat> Amsterdam is an, another example. It is located at uh, below sea level. So there's not one cause of sinking, but many, which makes solving the problem more complicated and sheds light on the need to approach it from many angles. If I can go to the next slide, please. Um, these are the OECD principles from which we examined the governance challenges. The assessment of challenges and opportunities follows the guiding framework provided by the OECD principles on, on water governance, which are 12 must do actions for governments to design and implement effective, efficient and inclusive water policies. The principles intend to contribute to tangible and outcome oriented public policies based on three mutually reinforcing and complementary dimensions of water governance, effectiveness, efficiency and trust and engagement. Um, if you can just click the arrow and then perfect. Thank you. Um, these are the governance gaps that are common in cities that were found from uh, the literature review and our interviews. Um, so the lack of effective integration between water and land use, but also transport, environmental management, housing and solid waste. So the inappropriate land use development can have significant socioeconomic impacts. For example, in the United States, high risk properties accounted for 38% of all flood payment claims between 1978 and 2004. Then um, the lack of strategic vision towards intergenerational equity and climate change resilience is also found to be a, another governance gap. So it's important to manage trade-offs related to fairness and equity and access to resources and services to ensure that general and specific interests manage trade-offs across water users in rural and urban areas and between current and future generations in terms of who pays for what. Um, for instance, to match the projected demand of the increasing population, world agricultural production would need to increase by some 60% between 2005 and 2050. Um, another gap is the fragmentation of, the, of urban water management conflicting interests and overlapping responsibilities. So this leads to a lack of coordination and overlaps and also the inefficient use of resources. So clarifying who does what and at what level of government can help identify potential mismatches, duplications or gray areas and assist in coordinating the actions of multiple players in an effective, efficient and inclusive way. Um, and so uh, for example, the uh, San Francisco Planning Department has a sea level rise adapt adaptation plan, which was created in 2016 um, and involves many different city departments. And so despite these collaborative efforts, there's often fragmentation because the responsibility is spread across so many departments. Um, the last gap is the variable technical, human, and financial capacities of subnational governments to respond to water challenges. So different, different cities face various challenges and have different capacities to respond to them. Um, and they have to work to engage stakeholders and properly implement policies at the same time. Many cities in OECD countries are likely to face capacity gaps to manage water properly. Urban generation can at times be capital intensive and one of the biggest obstacles to any capital intensive project is access to funding. Um, 
so these are the governance gaps that we identified in the paper and through our research. And if I could go to the next slide, this is part of the solution. Um, we, from the sinking issues comes this approach, which is, which we call the risk approach, um, resilience, inclusiveness, smartness, and circularity, um, because it depends on how cities will be waterproof and, and resilient in the future and how stakeholders will be engaged. So the solution can not only be technical, but it has to be seen in a much broader way. Using um, the three I's that we mentioned, so integration of policies, innovation, and investment, and considering these component, components can help cities achieve overall resilience. Um, effective resiliency policies to address sinking and proper integration of water and land use policies goes beyond infrastructure and technical solutions. It is key to identify the economics and governance conditions that could help sinking cities increase their resilience. This also considers that resilient cities are those that are inclusive, smart, and circular. These certain aspects highlight the importance of engaging with all stakeholders, including the urban poor and populations living in informal settlements, as these groups are often the highest at risk of experiencing floods, landslides, and other water-related risks. Cities should work towards resilience by promoting water efficiency in using smart water systems to collect data within city water use and its surrounding coastal or riverine waters. Additionally, resilience must include a circular approach in which cities work on innovative practices and a long-term cohesive vision to efficiently use and reuse available water resources. Further work on these practices and challenges will be needed to increase resilience in sinking cities that could be relevant to tackle other water-related risks. Finally, this work will contribute to a much broader project at the OECD of how this approach, this risk approach, so resilience, inclusiveness, smartness, and circularity um, can be applied to other cities, even apart from the terms of water governance. Um, and the next slide is just our conclusion and our information. And so feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Ash Ashley, for your excellent presentation. Uh, the framework that you presented helps to identify, identify main, main practices and challenges in balancing the water management and the governance of cities uh, with land use. I believe it will be very useful for a number of uh, cities in the world. And um, now we are moving to our last uh, but not least speaker. It's uh, Ms. Elodie Brelot. Uh, she's a doctor engineer from uh, INSA Lyon and director of GRAY. After completing a thesis in urban hydrology, she took over the management uh, of GRAY in 1994, uh, where she put professionals and scientists in the field of water management in touch. Uh, she works on the substances uh, through uh, actions of syn synthesis and enhancement of knowledge among uh, different audiences and in particular participation in working groups on regulations with the ministers uh, in charge of the environment and health. She also works on the form by animating research facilities and organizing meetings from regional working groups to international congresses. Um, Today, she will be presenting the topic uh, to guide territories uh, towards a planned change of urban stormwater management practices. Uh, Ms. Brillo, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Ludmila. It's a great pleasure to share the experience of our group, GRE, uh, in supporting uh, municipalities and uh, regions uh, in, uh, towards better management of stormwaters. So, uh, I wanted to share this uh, uh, um, slide to show you what is at stake when we talk about changing water management. Uh, so the idea is to move from a single pipe uh, model, which uh, leads to saturated ne networks uh, uh, with uh, overflows of our sewage systems and uh, 
um, also uh, negative economic effects. Uh, the, so with an uh, ever costlier management of water systems, pollution issues, uh, and uh, a uh, land planning tradition where soils uh, are impoverished. The idea is to move towards uh, cities that are more permeable, that are more porous, uh, not like a sieve, but more like a sponge. Uh, the idea is that the soil will be better nourished and that storm waters will be used as a resource towards a, a more sustainable uh, water management, uh, uh, greater biodiversity, and uh, um, use it as a resource against uh, hot spots and improve general quality of life. So our group was set up to uh, um, focus on these challenges uh, in a specific uh, uh, area of France. So I, I wanted to uh, share this uh, third model of uh, how to manage water in cities. And there are three levels of intervention. intervention. First, you need to share a uh, vision with all stakeholders. So uh, rainwater should be uh, deemed a resources by all uh, stakeholders. That's the main vision. Then you need an, a frame of action, a strategy to support sustainable management of stormwaters in cities. And the third level is uh, to uh, carry out uh, uh, projects, exemplary projects uh, that uh, show how we can uh, replan and uh, uh, reorganize uh, uh, our urban systems to integrate water. And all that requires a common technical and cultural um, knowledge base. So here, a few words about our organization, the GRE. We uh, were created uh, 30 years ago. The idea is uh, to support uh, a network uh, of professionals um, and researchers uh, um, to work towards more sustainable management of water in cities. And so we bring together professionals, uh, government officials, uh, municipal officials, uh, um, and we focus on three areas of work. Uh, so uh, we uh, co-ordinate uh, uh, research and co-construct uh, research projects. Then we uh, work organize a technical group work, uh, so exchange networks, working groups, and uh, best practice uh, observatories. And based on those two pillars of work, we uh, support uh, information dissemination, so how to ensure the genuine transfer knowledge and uh, knowledge appropriation. So we do this through publications, conferences, networking events, um, seconding experts to other groups, and web and social network tools to communicate to, to, uh, the, to our audience. So as I was saying, the first level of this system uh, requires a shared vision, a shared vision uh, shared by all stakeholders. So we're talking about uh, stakeholder, stakeholders, we're talking here about uh, elected representatives, uh, uh, technical professionals who need to be made aware of these issues. Uh, there's a specificity in France, uh, which is uh, the link between municipalities and intermunicipal um, or structures um, that needs to be taken into account. And what is important is that this vision is a vision not only for uh, water specific uh, um, uh, professionals, but also uh, by uh, all those in the city who are in charge of land planning, uh, of uh, uh, waste management, uh, etc. And they uh, must all contribute to uh, a more sustainable uh, method of water management. 
So another vision is possible. Here is uh, Vincent Calbeau's uh, a, a uto uh, utopian vision of uh, water management. Uh, here, this is slightly more realistic, even if it's still uh, uh, very spectacular here in uh, Singapore. Uh, so the, the, the role of water and nature in uh, an extremely modern and uh, ex extensive city um, is uh, questioned here. But if we look at uh, things at a more down-to-earth level, well, this uh, illustrates what we can do um, in a more uh, hands-on way. So, uh, so you have Philadelphia, uh, who made this presentation at the latest uh, Novatech uh, conference. And on the left-hand side, you have images of uh, uh, Lyon in uh, France. So to uh, then implement this vision, there are various uh, ways uh, of uh, um, contributing to uh, this. So since 1992, we've been organizing a um, technical conference called Novatech in uh, Lyon. It takes place every three years. And the idea is to bring together scientists uh, and the practitioners uh, to share their research and to talk about uh, what has been done, so feedback sessions and uh, think about what sustainable water management means and extend uh, the network of practitioners that we address. A second type of activity we carry out to uh, uh, embody this vision is the following. So trying to share this vision with decision makers and elected representatives. And so here um, we uh, focused uh, on the E1 model for water-wise uh, cities. Uh, um, and so we've extended uh, this vision to uh, larger territories than the municipalities. And the idea is to have a more a sustainable vision of water and uh, uh, a more sustainable land planning vision, integrating water and uh, taking into account uh, uh, the uh, catchment area and uh, create water-wise communities. And we've used the, we use this model uh, to um, uh, organize a number of uh, networks uh, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, in the various uh, areas of France. And uh, here um, we have a, a group of 23 um, municipal uh, decision makers uh, who came together to talk about how they manage uh, their water and the idea was to create a, a white paper uh, that would be a source of inspiration to uh, to others uh, and uh, a way of uh, rethinking water management a third way of uh, translating the vision into a reality is sharing uh, the vision with uh, uh, lay people, uh, lay uh, uh, communities, so people who are not a water uh, system um, professionals. And so we've developed uh, an educational uh, uh, website uh, with uh, uh, short video clips um, uh, that are uh, very humorous. Uh, so we have uh, um, comedians, well-known comedians who participated. And so it's uh, scientists and practitioners uh, who uh, wrote the various episodes and you, there are different illustrations. And the idea is uh, uh, to get the message across about uh, the water management uh, challenges and uh, issues at stake in uh, an upbeat way. So the second level of activity is the creation of a framework of action that enables uh, integrated stormwater management. So uh, there are uh, all sorts of regulatory tools and programs uh, that contribute to water management, but also to urban uh, management and uh, climate change adaptation uh, tools. And also landscape uh, tools. So within our group, we focused our work on defining uh, roles and uh, responsibilities for urban stormwater management. Uh, 
And so we uh, worked with a number of working groups, uh, conferences, uh, uh, networks, etc., national and international level. Uh, we uh, brought together all this knowledge uh, to um, come up with a number of handbooks uh, on the definition of uh, the various uh, roles and responsibilities for urban water management, uh, um, diagnostic studies, uh, preliminary studies, and integration of these issues uh, into uh, planning, land planning documents. Our third level of action is uh, the implementation of exemplary uh, stormwater management experiences. So the idea is uh, uh, to identify uh, sites where uh, land planning uh, is uh, taking place uh, and to see how we can integrate this uh, um, dimension. So f this requires having a uh, shared a technical and cultural knowledge base. Uh, and over the past 20 years, uh, we have been uh, um, supporting the uh, field observatory of uh, urban hydrology based in uh, Lyon, which is a multidisciplinary research center that aims a better understanding and defining uh, uh, stormwater management in urban areas, uh, identifying the challenges, uh, the impacts, and uh, uh, the ways of mobilizing uh, decision makers uh, and other stakeholders uh, to improve stormwater management and uh, um, uh, with a focus on nature-based solutions to improve uh, um, land planning. So this observatory um, has generated uh, a number of uh, um, pieces of knowledge, uh, but also uh, has identified a number of perceptions or, or, or general ideas of circulating on these issues. And at, uh, uh, we've been working with two other observatories in Nantes and Paris. And this has been a very stimulating uh, experience uh, and a good tool to disseminate information uh, to the field. So we also worked with a number of technical uh, working groups uh, on recommendations, on drafting recommendations. The idea was uh, uh, to debunk a number of myths uh, and uh, uh, prejudiced ideas uh, on uh, wastewater, uh, on stormwater management. So uh, focusing on uh, current knowledge about stormwater and uh, uh, provide more information about uh, uh, swales about uh, um, green roofs uh, and uh, um, ditches, etc. So all these solutions uh, and and porous uh, pavements, for example, and uh, also address uh, real or perceived dangers uh, such as uh, uh, water table. Uh, Pollution, etc. So, uh, a third example uh, here you have 260 uh, experimental uh, sites uh, where we have uh, gathered uh, knowledge and uh, understanding as to the type of uh, technical solutions chosen, uh, their strengths and limitations. On the basis of all this work, we've been uh, thinking about the future, how to better support uh, um, municipalities or, uh, or larger groups of decision makers to make progress. So um, one of our ideas is to create a national network of professionals, practitioners, uh, uh, and uh, uh, local network representatives to better share knowledge about storm waters, encourage sharing of experience, and offer a, a, a fora for exchange. A second uh, idea was to focus at the, on the local level 
to better raise awareness on these issues and uh, disseminate knowledge about uh, uh, water management. So all our publications, all our information is available on our website. We uh, have uh, a number of uh, partners uh, that have been supporting us, uh, whether they be operational, financial, or uh, research uh, um, uh, organizations. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for excellent presentation, Ms. Bello. I think a lot of people will agree that the idea with involving and educating of non-professionals uh, about important questions in water or climate change is really amazing, as well as involving of uh, youth in uh, um, solving all of these questions. I just want to mention then that, that um, this Monday we had a youth online panel and uh, we gathered uh, their uh, thoughts of use from different regions on challenges and solutions and uh, how the role of use can be uh, engaged in this and some uh, uh, messages to policy. And I also invite not only use but uh, senior professionals to our use declaration session on Friday. Uh, so I hope you can hear some uh, thoughtful st thoughts from uh, you, you in that few minutes. And now uh, I would like to move uh, to the question and A session. Uh, we received some sessions from the chat from the audience. And um, I would like to start with uh, Miss uh, with question to Miss uh, Saikia. Um, uh, the question... Uh, it's like this, uh, how the city water resilience approach, uh, our water digital tool and city water resilience framework were co-created. Thank you so much for the question. Yes, it was co-created like I mentioned through uh, engagement with cities about from the methodology I mentioned about talking of desktop review, literature reviews that were conducted to understand how governance help in enhancing resilience, that is how governance indicators were created for the framework. Uh, and also with the Our Water Digital tool, engaging with uh, digital experts and also with the cities. There were specific workshops, inception workshops that were organized in the cities. Field works were done, key informant interviews were conducted to understand the situations in different cities and from varied geographies, like I mentioned, the eight cities to understand so that it is globally applicable. So uh, that is why I was saying that it's kind of an approach developed by cities for uh, cities. Uh, for the framework itself, the indicators, uh, qualitative indicators were developed based on the data that was gathered from the uh, literature reviews, uh, the attributes around governance, uh, water governance principle that Colette talked about the OECD water governance principles, those kind of different tools that talk of uh, different water governance aspect were studied to include some of those indicators. Uh, and then uh, it was kind of also looked into some cities whether quantitative data are available or not. Uh, and that is more adapted that once the qualitative analysis is done, that is more aligned than with the quantitative data based on the availability in different cities. Uh, when it was applied again in Cape Town and Miami. I hope that addresses the question. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much for answering. Um, also, we have here questions to Miss Ashley. Um, there are two of them. First is what are the different causes leading to city sinking? And uh, second, what are the various ways proposed by OSSED to cover the government gaps? So please. Great, um, thank you for the questions. So as I mentioned, sinking can, uh, is not really one issue of vulnerability. So it concerns a combination of sea level rise, uh, flood risk and land subsidence. And land subsidence is a geographical phenomenon. I mean, sorry, geological phenomenon. And um, it further exposes cities to more frequent and more severe water related disasters. And so these um, combined effects of climate change in terms of sea level rise, increasing frequency of extreme precipitation and increasing intensity of hurricanes drive an increased flood risk. So, and we also mentioned natural and anthropogenic causes. So this can include um, over extraction of groundwater, which can be linked to increased population and urbanization. 
as well as saltwater intrusion. Um, and then uh, if you have the second question, uh, the, so the second question was on how to um, approach the government governance gaps, excuse me. Um, and so this was uh, addressed by our risk approach. So resilience, considering aspects of resilience, inclusiveness, smartness, and circularity. Um, and so within this, we propose to integrate land use and water into city resilience plans, um, promote nature-based and green infrastructure solutions in land use planning, um, integrate a water perspective into urban housing policies to ensure quality access and water efficiency, and to then also use land use to protect water resources and expand storage capacities. Thank you. Thank you very much for answering. Uh, also, we have here a question to uh, Ms. Brillon. Um, what is your approach to involve the different stakeholders? It's the first question. And other, how do you organize the link between professionals and students? Please. Thank you for this question. Can you hear me? Now, in the uh, Rhone Alp region, uh, there is uh, a research university which uh, is uh, working uh, now and uh, which is the interface between practitioners, uh, scientists, uh, uh, teachers, and students. Uh, and uh, we have a whole organization with all the uh, uh, schools in the region uh, to establish the link between research and practice. We want students to have a more pluridisciplinary approach, to have access uh, to lectures in other schools so that they have the uh, holistic uh, view of uh, the water issue. They took part in uh, uh, laboratory research, research labs, and uh, we asked them also to uh, go on uh, uh, traineeship. Uh, this is a very strong dynamics based on a pluridisciplinary approach. So uh, uh, in our organization, uh, we were uh, centered uh, on professionals and scientists. And now we are moving towards uh, uh, opening up to future uh, professionals in water management, in town planning, and other issues related to different territories, including uh, water issues. I have a question, another question. I was asked if uh, uh, in 2050 uh, cities uh, will be environmental friendly cities. I'm sure that, uh, well, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, the thing is we're not creating um, the cities uh, from scratch. We are trying to move our cities towards more sustainable cities. And this is a real challenge. We have to seize all opportunities when uh, a road is being rebuilt. Uh, we have to really use uh, uh, this opportunity uh, to uh, 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 collect rainwater, reuse it, and move towards more environmental friendly cities. Thank you. Thank you very much for answer. Uh, also, we have for this other question to Ms. Sa Saikia. Uh, what was the process of validation of the city water resilient framework? What organizations took part in it? Can you please comment? I'm sorry, you're muted. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, I'm sorry I missed in uh, mentioning that previously and thank you for raising that question on validation. Uh, this is very crucial because it was uh, once that conceptual framework was built uh, along with the five steps plus the tools, the Our Water Digital Tool and the assessment framework. It was validated in a workshop that gathered global experts uh, that included OECD, World Bank, 100 Resilience Cities, uh, the Resilient Shift, Arug, uh, uh, Stockholm International Water Institute, different experts that gathered, and also city stakeholders. There were um, different um, city representatives from all the eight cities that we, uh, we had engaged at partner during the whole uh, development process. So the validation uh, workshop was very crucial in terms of making it more practical tool from the conceptual to make it more actionable, globally applicable tool. 
And not just a validation, but the piloting is also crucial in both the cities in Cape Town and Miami, because the tools were also kind of improved uh, after that workshop we had first with Cape Town in order to implement again in, in Miami. So these processes were very useful to engage with cities. Uh, the cities are actually the key um, uh, builders in terms of this whole approach and the tools because uh, they had provided the crucial and practical uh, oriented uh, inputs and insights. Uh, and it will be like for the step four and five, uh, currently the resilient ship is engaging with Cape Town in terms like last year we had the assessment and visioning workshop. So now they're engaging with the city stakeholders in, in order to uh, see how it would be implemented in terms of the implementation strategies, how can risk uh, informed strategies could be built to implement those activities and then having a evaluation and learning uh, strategy so that this kind of processes can be done in, in a time frame for maybe in a five years gap or 10 years gap, the resilience assessment could be done again and again. So these are like really crucial in terms of piloting and we are also looking forward uh, in the beginning you mentioned about having implemented in low income countries. Um, we are also looking now with the resilient shift is, uh, together with the Water Resource Institute will be implementing in some of the African cities, uh, looking into how uh, the assessment takes place in there. So yes, we will have more findings from those implementation as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for answering. Uh, we have some more questions to Ms. Ashley. Um, uh, what has been the most difficult obstacle to implement water policies in sinking cities? Can you please answer this? Yes, so one of um, the most difficult obstacles is um, communicating the importance of green infrastructure over gray infrastructure, um, because gray infrastructure is often um, the first uh, response um, to these kind of problems. Um, and also another challenge is um, getting proper funding to have initiatives that are more preemptive um, and mitigative than post disaster or post flood or anything like that. So those are two main challenges that, that are facing. Thank you so much for answering. And I think it will be our last question for today uh, to Ms. Brillo. What kind of major me measures are applied for urban fl flood risk management by using sponge city approach, especially for water lodging disasters, effective measures? Did you hear me well, Ms. Brillo? Oui, merci pour cette question. Alors, Thank je you. Uh, for this question, I will uh, uh, maybe agree with uh, uh, Colette after the gray solutions, you have the green solutions that have to be uh, uh, favored. Uh, the uh, problem uh, in managing uh, flawed risk is uh, uh, due to the fact that if you want uh, uh, different uh, basins uh, to uh, manage uh, uh, storm water that remains the most efficient solution. Uh, infiltration by by storm water. Uh, it, it takes a, a longer period of time, and uh, uh, within the framework of the different uh, opportunities that we have, when the town is being developed, uh, we can use such solutions. When there are crises, you have to find a balance between the two. And uh, the, one of the challenges is to have time to deconnect rather than moving towards large scale systematic investments. Uh, but of course, uh, it, it doesn't mean that we are moving towards uh, uh, pipeless uh, countries. We do have basins, uh, uh, we have pipes. We need to uh, find a, a system so that the town as a whole can uh, be adapted to uh, uh, different uh, events because there is a, a, a total uncertainty about rainfall, about drought and, and so on. That was a, a, a quick answer to the question. Um, thank you very much for answer. And uh, I would like to thank all of the speakers for this fruitful hour. I believe a lot of people uh, found uh, uh, some new interesting and uh, useful things in your presentations. Uh, you shared 
these um, examples of approaches that you work on uh, that was uh, successfully implemented, for example, in such cities as Cape Town, Greater Miami and the beaches, Hoboken, the city of Portland, New Orleans, and also in such organizations as, as uh, Lyon Metropole and La um, Ronesse de Lo. Um, I would like to wish you good luck in the further uh, work and um, um, hope we will hear much more uh, examples of implementation, successful implementation. And uh, I also would like to thank to all of the audience who join us today. Um, in a five minutes, we will have a next session, uh, innovative uh, in initiatives. And I think now I will hand over to the organizers. Thank you very much. Our world is undergoing unprecedented changes. Human activity is increasing. Our towns and cities are growing. Now, more than ever, water needs us. Water treatment is our responsibility. A story of men and women, of commitment and skills. This is the story of Sia. We collect, transport, and clean wastewater from the nine million inhabitants of the greater Paris area. Our 440 kilometer network of pipes is managed in real time with forecasting and regulation tools that enable us to anticipate all situations and to optimize flow management. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Every day in our plants, we treat 2.5 million cubic meters of wastewater. Thanks to skills and equipment that are unique in Europe. Our vision is durable and aimed at the long term. We're committed to developing our business in a responsible way. We're investing regularly in the modernization of our plants and in the development of innovative solutions that protect the environment. Each one of us, whatever our job, is working in the public interest towards our goal, the preservation of the natural environment and biodiversity. At SEAP, we are proud to be a public enterprise with 40 years of experience in serving the greater Paris area. And we have more than 1,700 staff who share this commitment and passion. For today and tomorrow. Thank you. Um... Mesdames et Messieurs, notre seconde et dernière session du jour, uh, session innovante. Right, ladies and gentlemen, second session, innovative initiatives. Uh, uh, Mrs. Diana, as you have the floor. Um, our session, the second session is again on innovation. And as it has been said in the session just before, it's uh, very important, uh, even if we have technology, uh, to share uh, the organization to share governance to see how we can work together 
how we can develop no knowledge and, and, and work. And I'm particularly happy as the IWA uh, president uh, to share that uh, second part, which will show example of uh, wide uh, and global cooperation in order to push innovation. So we have three main uh, pr proposal and cement topics. And I will very quickly start with the first uh, presentation in order not to waste uh, too much time. Uh, so, e Emmanuel uh, de Romero, Emmanuel, I'm, I hope you're, you're there. I'm sure you're, you're already there. Yeah. So, Emmanuel, I will present you very quickly. You are a retired uh, military uh, lieutenant general and you are a founder of the More Water for Sahel initiative. Through operational intelligence, uh, you are bringing innovative ways to bridge gap between thinking, deciding, and acting. Uh, you will, uh, Christina Bassoni Arsidiakono will also speak very quickly uh, after you. She's a scientist specialized, specialized in energy, environment, and development. She holds a master in sustainable development, a PhD in physics, and a diploma in politics. And there are two authors which won't have time to speak, but I want just to say their name. Stéphane Brabant is a partner at global law firm Herbert Smith Fritz Hill. He is the head of the Chris Management Group for Africa. He has a lot of experience on project and transactional uh, lawyer. And uh, he, is a specific, he has a specific expertise on blockchain issues. So I think it was interesting to hear about. And Sébastien Cusnier is the founder and CEO of uh, IT for Life, a company based in Dakar in, C in Senegal, which is dedicated to providing the best information technology service to NGOs, association and social enterprise. So your presentation is how to show how putting together people and multi, um, multi stakeholders help in uh, developing knowledge, education, and, and mainly governance in groundwater resource management. Groundwater resource management, which is a key uh, aspect when you, when you need water, especially in, uh, in Africa. So, uh, Emmanuel, it's the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you to, I just uh, expressed my thanking to all the people from UNESCO mode and all the people, all the wonderful team who have been working to manage that. I'm going to speak in the name of my three colleagues, and I hope I will get let some time enough to Christiana to end up at the end of my briefing to uh, sum up and, and point out some issues. But unfortunately, Stéphane Brabant and uh, Sébastien Custier, which is in Dakar, right now will not be able to speak, but I'm really pleased to speak on the name because it's absolutely key that, uh, and this is a key point of our project is integration of multi-actors. So it's a reason why, by the way, we call it IM4D for all the four, four actors, what type of actors, dimension, things that we want to integrate. So let's start very quickly by summary. Next slide. Just wait, we're going to review, uh, sorry, the slide before <laughs> summary, uh, that we were going to pass a main message and how, uh, well, what type of challenge we face today, how, uh, what are the opportunity which is open today and also we'll conclude. Next slide. Next, the uh, main message today, it's addressed to a decision maker, just from a decision making point of view for all people involved, policy makers, all the people, just looking at water, the key thing is, is the key message is there is an opportunity to be seized right now because there is today a combination of system thinking, blockchain logic, uh, all the most advanced state of the art technology and also digital tools, which allow to build and run a sort of innovative multi data, multi actors digital platform. And this is a key thing if we uh, assume, if you look uh, from a comprehensive view on water issues, is to think to fill the gap between thinking, deciding, and acting. And this is today, the, the thing we, we can consider is to, that we are able to offer to the best political, strategic, and tactical, and tactical options to the, the decision makers. And this is a point taking into account that the key things is in a combination of three dimension, three pillars, knowledge, education, and governance. Next slide, please. Uh, these three pillars are the DNA of, uh, of the More Water for Sale initiative that I represent here with Christiana and others, and that has been created in 2018. 
and just combination of three factors which is making a huge difference if we combine and if we want to have an impact on the long run on short-term, mid-term and long-term issue. This is a challenge number one. Challenge, next slide, please. On the challenge number two, I will argue that the question is, is um, I will use a military world. You said, Jan, I'm a former military, I'm a former pilot. In fact, I'm a general from the French Air Force. So, and we used to speak about situation awareness and having a visibility and to go for the future, you need to integrate the past, the current situation, and also foresee the possible scenario for the future. And this is absolutely key that now we need to have different option. We all know that. So we need to put this maker in a position to be able to integrate and combine things. And this is a word, mainly the buzzword of our presentation is to combining action and combining things. Next slide, please. In that respect, I think we, we consider now today with all the information technology, all the system, the water things, exploration techniques, uh, detection thing, all the system thinking, and also this operative intelligence approach that I've personally developed based on my military and operational experience, and also the blockchain, and I will come back on that, offers us, uh, I'm mean, speaking collectively, a way to an opportunities to align thinking, decision-making, and action. This is absolutely key, and I will insist on two factors, the factor of blockchain. Regarding the blockchain, we can say we were sure if we look at that, that the blockchain approach is completely adapted and suited for um, uh, multiple sources of information for record and having relevant to bring relevant information. And um, it will bring confidence, it will bring reliable information, it will be able to as assemble a lot of data. And also it will bring one thing which is absolutely missing right now is a question of trust, not a question of distrust, but the question of neutral, neutral trust at all levels. And also the blockchain, and especially you were referring to the expertise of uh, um, Maître Stéphane Brabant, but also we work with a crucial chain, a uh, um, company specialized in that. And we are convinced that uh, really in combination with IT for Life that uh, Sebastian Kenny is running, there is a potential to organize a thing differently and to work and to have, uh, I say, to, to accept, to rethink the eco water system and concluding the economic part. And this is combination of the time of where the, we have now a tremendous opportunity. So I will argue that blockchain offers us a way to be more transparent and to uh, correct and to uh, think about data. And, and lastly, it's about connecting experts. This is in our DNA, the more water water initiative, but the key things is about connecting experts who are all specialized in decision-making process and combining action and, and be able to implement complex projects as we do in the military. But the question, it's the reason why we speak and I will finish with the uh, concept of water peace operation. Next slide, please. Regarding what, what the platform, what is IMD4? The IMD4 is a decision-making tool It designed to comprehensive, provide comprehensive approach. And I will insist we're never comprehensive enough, never and also identify the right priorities. And, and, and the main thing is to formulate and implement the best choices accordingly, I mean, in accordance, aligned in the free domain to allow the combination of action in exploration and education and dominance field. Next slide, please. Regarding action in terms of knowledge, I will not go into details, but you notice the word data it's absolutely key, it's coming in all the bullets point. And it's the reason why I think the challenge again is to combine and go from uh, top down to bottom up approach and combine data. And this is all, all today the challenge. And if we look at what happens with uh, the COVID, the fact that we are interacting today, it's proved that everything, a lot of things are possible as long as we process it correctly and we put it uh, correctly. Next slide, please. And regarding education, uh, you, I will argue that if you ask me what is the most important thing, it's about education. There is really a room of manoeuvre for improvement. If we consider four key indicators, number of people trained, level of transfer knowledge, training, quality, course, skill evolutions, there is a lot of things that can be done to keep the memory alive and to put the things in the right process. I think we lost a lot of knowledge and there is a, a knowledge that should be in a collective uh, manner reorganized. And this is something we need to invest on the younger generation in a more 
in an international endeavor. That's my point. Next slide, please. And regarding governance, I will repeat without a decompatibilization or de stove pipe, um, we can put that on the eight decision makers with relevant information and also have a sort of continuity ensuring uh, scientific studies, noting that science should be at the center of this approach. And by, by the fact that we're not centered this way, science, which is bringing solution, is not at the core business uh, core things and, and should uh, regain its place. Next slide, please. And just finish with two, two slides, just enhancing the, and insisting on, on the notion of, um, again, on situation awareness. This thing will, able, will enable and empower the decision makers to have a better knowledge and run water resources, reserve things. But knowing is not sufficient. It should be also accompanied with a possible action that you can take. So information going to action. And this is a military man speaking. This is really why it is, I think, argue it will make a difference. And it will make also a difference regarding water and cities, because if you oppose the thing rural to urban areas, if you look from a groundwater perspective, uh, there is no difference between rurality and, and urbanity, urban cities. And I think the future of access to, in ground water, to water in big cities will rely on this ability to manage groundwater issue. If you look at Dakar, what is providing water in Dakar, this is a, a system a reservoir and aquifer, which is a, uh, standing about to more than 200 kilometers from Dakar. So it will bring new perspective. Yes, there is a possibility of change and mitigate, by the way, de facto the instability in cell region. Next slide, please. And it will be last slide. Our conclusion, and then I will let Christiana, if Dian, you allow me, and in terms of time, just conclusion about the criteria of success. Yes, it is more transparency, more effectiveness, more efficiency and convergency in terms of efforts, just combining things to have everything okay. And this is a specialty in things that we can do. So we need to think comprehensively, but also to act accordingly. And also we need to think a little bit differently and use it concept just as project area concept, water piece operation, I think in the system now, we need to adapt the system and to rethink things uh, to in order to go more participation. And, and, and uh, it has been said in previous uh, conference, previous lectures, that the question of bringing together stakeholders is absolutely key. And this is what is all about, is bringing a way to proceed and to organize the interaction, the interconnection of all the actors and stakeholders. And among them, they will, one, are. Uh, absolutely key in Africa are security and strategic actors and this is why I am personally working with the World Bank on this issue and as um, to work and also it should be taken into account the way that we need to uh, combine all database and this is where the kind of priority and put the right priorities because, right priorities because we can't cover everything. With that said and the rushing time sorry for my um, my speed of uh, I speed of speaking, but I think the, this question of being in speed of trust, I will argue. I'll let and over to Christiana if you want to complete and add some words, Christiana. Christiana, for you, uh, two minutes. Two minutes, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, thank you again, uh, the organizer of UNESCO, for having us and for all your great work. Uh, well, uh, in, in summary, what we want to stress here is like this is an innovative uh, platform, and we are still looking for partners and any resources and ideas that they can uh, improve uh, our project. So, what is the one of the first, uh, the main key in uh, this kind of project is the fact that we are using uh, innovative technology, especially the blockchain, that is going to ensure that the platform is working in a transparent way and is going to uh, distribute the data to all stakeholders. I want to remark that because as a scientist, I was working on various databases and it was very stressful for a researcher to look what was the most updated data and to be conscious of how reliable was the data and then to, to, to be in connection with the other researcher. So in this way, we can uh, very in a very transparent and efficient way track our data and reinforce the capability at the local level. 
and also in increasing the capacity of local communities for their economies. Because the more you are aware of what is happening for water, uh, for your water resources, then economy can uh, also flourish. If we, we want to connect uh, with the COVID uh, issue or any kind of epidemic that is uh, when we know that is, for example, it's it's, uh, it's a big issue for uh, Sahelian and for African countries. Well, uh, uh, thanks to water and the tracking of the water, we can have early information about the onset of the epidemic. So this is also another point that we can put forward. But uh, please uh, do contact us. Uh, we, we are really keen uh, to, to learn more and to join with other people, new ideas, new resources. Thank you very much, Christina and Emmanuel. And being in time, it's always uh, difficult. Uh, question will uh, come later on. We are going to do the three presentation and then uh, go back to you and ask question. So a second example of cooperation, which is uh, key, uh, which will uh, presented by Rae Zimmerman. Uh, Rae is a research professor and professor emerita of planning and public administration at New York University Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. And following a full-time tenure professorship, uh, is uh, currently direct, she is currently direct New York University Wagner Institute for Civil Infrastructure System. She has authored or co-edited a half dozen books, including transport, environment, and security. Uh, and uh, she holds a business administration in chemistry, uh, a master of city planning for from uh, University of Pennsylvania, and a PhD in planning for Columbia University. Uh, please, Rai, can you speak about green infrastructure? I'm very happy that we tackle that great innovation, but I think you are going to speak more about how to implement, what are the conditions that you can get green infrastructure, how you make people work together and not discuss about the technology itself. So please, Rai, it's your floor. Uh, thank you, Diane, and uh, I also want to thank the organizers at NESCO uh, very, very much uh, for this entire conference, uh, and our paper does uh, address uh, one of the innovations, green infrastructure for stormwater management. Uh, before I begin, I do want to acknowledge my co-authors, Bernice Rosenzweig, who has recently joined the faculty of Sarah Lawrence, uh, college uh, uh, as a tenured faculty member, and she's an expert in hydrology and the sciences, et cetera. And also uh, Alan Cohn, Managing Director of Integrated Water Management uh, at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, and uh, he has been a very valuable uh, stakeholder and collaboration in a lot of the research uh, I have been doing. And I do want to acknowledge the support of the National Science Foundation, um, uh, Urex Project, a project that is uh, uh, based in Arizona State University. Next slide. Uh, just quickly, the structure will be uh, introduction methods, results, and conclusions, and this is based on um, uh, this is based on a paper that is actually now um, on uh, uh, you know is is on the uh, conference website. Uh, by way of uh, introduction, the problem is enormous uh, because you have natural hydrologic systems often modified as cities. Uh, begin to develop and alter their waterways. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it occurs for many reasons. And uh, what happens is your gray infrastructure uh, replaces a lot of the, is, is used primarily uh, for stormwater management and replaces a lot of the natural systems, um, whether you have sewage and wastewater, uh, but this occurs for precipitation events. And you've got water quality uh, impact, impacts occurring um, and contributions to multiple types of flooding uh, that result from using just gray infrastructure. So green infrastructure has been introduced to increase 
water retention through the use of vegetation and soils and to trap pollutants. Uh, and it has social and ecological co-benefits as well. Some of these issues were addressed in papers presented in the last session. Uh, we use mega cities as a platform, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York. We take an integrated approach uh, in line with the uh, NSF sponsored uh, Urban Resilience to Extreme Sustainability Research Net Network at, AS at Arizona State University. And it consists of a social dimension, which we focus on finance and institutions, ecological, uh, which uh, is physiographic, climatological, and uh, technological, which is reflected in uh, green infrastructure technologies and their interface with conventional stormwater. Next slide, please. So uh, as I said, the methodologies uh, include uh, focusing on three major mega cities. Uh, New York and LA uh, do qualify as me mega cities because they exceed 10 million in population and Chicago's population is getting there. Um, and the map to, uh, on the side shows them, and, and this is in the paper as well, uh, and it's mapped against the precipitation intensity. We also use um, a lot of city information and the American Society of Landscape Architects databases for, um, for finance. Uh, next slide. So uh, we take a quick look at the mega cities um, the uh, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles uh, has a number of, of problems with sediment loss, large loss, large scale flooding, uh, and they've tried to manage this through gray infrastructure, and uh, they're under a clean, a federal U.S. Clean Water Act permit and water quality limits uh, expressed as TMDLs, which stands for Total Maximum daily loads of a pollutant that a particular waterway can withstand. Chicago also flat topography, shallow groundwater, relying on gray infrastructure. They actually reversed the Chicago River to manage water quality. Uh, New York City has uh, pluvial flooding from cloudburst uh, episodes and the stormwater is typically managed through gray infrastructure uh, as well. Next slide, please. Uh, just very quickly, um, this uh, can be seen better in the paper, but uh, there's a performance metric under the New York City Green Infrastructure Plan, which translates um, uh, water uh, that is coming in uh, against, the, uh, uh, against what the green infrastructure is trapping. Now, this is for uh, water quality. That's the main emphasis. And we're going to need new kinds of metrics if we want to adapt this to flooding. Next slide, please. Uh, there, as I said, we are adapting this SETS framework uh, and we are focusing for social on institutional and financial programs. The institutional or the regulatory programs under the Clean Water Act uh, that uh, really frame this whole action and consent degrees and G green infrastructure finance, which is very diverse, but tends to rely uh, based on our uh, prior research on a few major sources of funding. Uh, ecological uh, green infrastructure is, uh, d relies on vegetation and soil properties um, and uh, alterations in natural landscapes uh, to promote uh, to promote water quality and water retention and technological, the gray infrastructure and the green infrastructure are both uh, water management technologies. Um, next slide. So uh, in conclusion, uh, green infrastructure is very much a cross-cutting approach to stormwater management, which we really desperately need. We can't only do uh, technology, uh, only focus on vegetation uh, and the social uh, elements. We need to weave these together to get this going. So there are multiple objectives. 
Now, um, as I mentioned, uh, green infrastructure has mainly been um, adapted to um, uh, uh, the Clean Water Act compliance, but there are really a lot of opportunities for new funding if we integrate green infrastructure to maximize flood reduction as well as water quality. Right now, green infrastructure is financed all, all over the place, um, but uh, it ends up using just a few main kinds of, uh, uh, kinds of, uh, of finance. And then third, uh, the uh, green infrastructure approach that we've described in the paper for just three cities can be leveraged and scaled and be transferable across different geographic uh, areas. So uh, a very rich area, up and coming. Uh, there are some challenges uh, to be sure. And as I mentioned, we acknowledge the uh, NSF grant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rai. Very interesting to see that there is still lots to do and yes. it's not just technology. I mean, it's, uh, it's also the, the way to implement and uh, I think it is a bit the common topic between our three uh, presentation. So, and we will come back on that uh, later with question. Uh, next presentation is, uh, is the uh, presentation with uh, Eric Rosenblum and Shannon uh, uh, Spurlock. Uh, Eric, uh, is an environmental engineer based in the Silicon Valley area of Northern California who helps industrial and municipal clients use water more sustainably through water reuse projects. Hello, Eric. You have a very nice picture behind you, although it is night, so it's not the reality. You are in, in the very morning of today, far away. Previously, Eric, you manage operation at uh, six 1,000 cubic meter per day wastewater treatment plant and was responsible for the design, the construction and the startup and operation of the region first urban water recycling project. So you have been involved in a number of research projects on opportunities to use water most sustainably. And I am very happy to make a special publicity for my organization because you are co-editor of the Sustainable Industrial Water Use Perspective Incentive and Tools, a book which will be published by IWA Publishing in January 2021. So welcome to that book again, and I'm happy you do that with IWA. Uh, Shannon Spurlock, uh, she's the founder and principal of uh, Octo. Okotona, so, sorry, Okotona Consulting. She has a passion uh, for organizational development, policy advancement, and shareholder engagement, which is, as uh, we have seen, uh, very important. She has in deep experience creating community-driven food system and thrives when working with stakeholders to identify and promote shared program and policy priorities. It's very nice to have someone with more specialized on food because the connection between water and agriculture is not yet uh, as it should be. Um, this is how she came to work with and love water reuse. Beginning in 2013, Shannon worked with stakeholders throughout Colorado uh, to expand the hallowed application of recycled water to include food crops so that agriculture have an ongoing sustainable irrigation source. After almost seven years, the rules to allow this new use went into effect in January 2020. So reuse can be uh, in, in agriculture. So really to have uh, the experience of your both in the reuse and how to implement it, technology there, but again, how you manage to make people to work together in order to be sure that we can uh, do and develop reuse. So floor open to your presentation, Eric and uh, Shannon. It's up to you. Thank you, Diane, and thank you to those of you tuning in today. Shannon and I are very pleased to be with you to discuss how utilities that serve the world's largest cities can work together to use and reuse water sustainably. First, however, we'd like to acknowledge the sponsorship of the United States Environmental Protection Agency and our colleague Dave Smith, Assistant Director for Water at EPA's Region 9. We'd also like to recognize our team members, Dr. Bob Rauscher, the late Dr. Bachman Sheikh, and Felicia Marcus, who is presenting this Friday afternoon 
on teamwork and water security. Next. A few years ago, UNESCO published Wastewater, the Untapped Resource to highlight the importance of water reuse. Next. Interagency cooperation is the key to developing this important resource. In California, for example, the most populous of the United States, more than 3,000 separate agencies manage various facets of the water system, drinking water, sewage collection, wastewater treatment, stormwater management, Integrated water management is not possible unless these agencies work together. The largest city in California, Los Angeles, is striving to overcome these challenges with their One Water LA 2040 plan. Other large cities around the world all face similar problems. Next. In February of this year, the US EPA released its National Water Reuse Action Plan which outlined dozens of actions to help state and local agencies expand the use of recycled water. One item was specifically designed to support local and regional reuse projects by identifying challenges, opportunities, and models for interagency collaboration. In our presentation today, we will briefly describe our approach and what we have learned so far. For more detailed information, we refer you to our paper. Next. Why should agencies collaborate? By working together, they can make better use of resources, repurposing wastewater and stormwater and other impaired sources as a water supply. They can more easily achieve economies of scale and economies of scope, increasing benefits and reducing costs. And they can communicate more uniformly with the public, reducing confusion. Next. But this type of coordination is easier said than done. For example, before water and wastewater agencies can cooperate on a recycled water project, they must understand how it will serve both their purposes. Then they must define their part of the project, hold each other accountable, and find a way to communicate effectively. Fortunately, there are many good examples for us to study as we focus on five main factors of interagency collaboration. Governance, regulatory issues, economic factors, technical challenges, and leadership and interpersonal skills. We'll look briefly at these factors and a few case studies that shed light on them, beginning with some Texas water agencies. Next. Agency structures reflect the purpose for which they were created. Agencies are granted authority to raise money through taxes and fees within a defined geographic area for specific social purposes. Some agencies may even be legally prevented from providing services not specified in their charters. As a result, different agencies invest in water reuse for different reasons. It's important to acknowledge these differences. Next. Four North Texas agencies have demonstrated the ability to work together despite the fact that they were each created for different reasons. The city of Dallas was founded in 1856 on the east bank of the Trinity River. The Tarrant Regional Water District was created in 1924 to provide water and flood control service to the city of Fort Worth on the west bank of the same river. In 1952, the North Texas Municipal Water District was created to serve water to suburbs north of Dallas and Fort Worth, while around the same time, the Trinity River Water Authority was established to create a master plan for basin-wide development. Both the authority and the water district operate wastewater treatment plants to help protect the water of this Trinity River. The point of this history lesson is that each of these agencies was created for a different reason at a different time for a different place. And now they collectively are responsible for managing water for some 7 million people in the area. Fortunately, as they grew into this responsibility, they created an agreement, the Upper Trinity River Compact to coordinate their programs. And as a result, they now successfully work together to reuse water through innovative schemes like the East Fork Project, which recycles 400 million cubic meters of treated effluent per day, polishing it in a constructed wetland over 700 hectares in area and the blended water is put into a reservoir for reuse as drinking water. Next. Regulations also have a big impact on how agencies work together. 
They can inhibit cooperation or they can motivate utilities to cooperate. On the, on the one hand, water reuse is heavily regulated. Recycled water must meet strict requirements and there are standards for pipelines and plumbing that distributes recycled water. Agencies must decide which utility is responsible for meeting which regulations. Next. On the other hand, restrictions on effluent discharge coupled with restrictions on water supply can motivate agencies to reuse water. In 2010, on the east coast of the United States, the EPA imposed new limits on the nutrients discharged into the Chesapeake Bay. At about the same time, the state of Virginia began restricting groundwater withdrawals to prevent seawater intrusion into the aquifer. The cities in this region calculated it would cost them more than 3 billion US dollars to remove nutrients to meet the new regulations. However, the Hampton Roads Sanitation District, which treats the region's wastewater, determined that for about 1 billion US dollars, they could remove virtually all the nutrients from the wastewater and fill the aquifer, meeting nutrient limits and providing recycled water for potable use, solving both problems at less than half the cost. Next. This example also shows how water reuse is often the least costly alternative when all factors are considered. It usually costs more to treat wastewater for reuse than for discharge. So on a short-term basis, reuse often appears more expensive, especially compared with underpriced water supplies. Furthermore, non-potable water must be conveyed through a separate pipeline at additional expense, but it is sold for less than the cost of drinking water. So someone must subsidize the cost of service to make up the difference. These barriers often discourage agencies from investing in water reuse. Next. Despite these challenges, for nearly 50 years, Pima County in Arizona has maintained a successful partnership with the city of Tucson to share water reuse costs. Both the city and the county used to run their own wastewater treatment plants, and both were faced with growing population and a chronic water shortage. In 1979, they agreed to divide their responsibilities in order to reuse treated wastewater. The county took over all wastewater treatment, and the city assumed responsibility for further treatment and distribution of recycled water. Over the years, their agreement has been amended to reflect changes in infrastructure, but the partnership has endured. The two agencies recover the cost of providing recycled water through their combined water and wastewater charges. They even have a cooperative agreement where customers receive one bill for their combined services. Next. Once agencies agree to recycle water, there are still many technical issues to be resolved. In addition to water quality, the recycled water system must provide sustain a suitable pressure and flow to meet customer demands. And provisions must be made for emergency repairs in case of equipment failure or pipe breaks. Next. Reliable recycled water service was a key factor in success of the Castroville Seawater Intrusion Project in Monterey, California. 150 years of intense farming had lowered groundwater to the point that this coastal aquifer was becoming contaminated by seawater. The Monterey Regional Water Pollution Control Agency, now called Monterey One Water, proposed sending its treated effluent to farmers to use instead of the groundwater they were pumping. The farmers had many questions about the safety of recycled water, but they were also concerned about the reliability since without water, their crops would fail. Working with farmers and local irrigation districts, Monterey One Water designed and built a distribution system that was even more reliable than the pumps the farmers were previously depending upon. And building on the success, they are now working with local water agencies to replenish the aquifer with highly treated wastewater treated to drinking water standards. At this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Shannon, to Shannon Spurlock to discuss the importance of leadership in maintaining good interagency relationships. Shannon. Thank you so much, Eric. Next slide, please. Successful interagency collaboration often boils down 
to the ability of individual agencies to align their priorities in order to achieve shared goals. The importance of the individuals who spearhead these efforts cannot be overstated. These leaders drive change by mobilizing their colleagues and their organizations at large. They are champions of change. Even more importantly, they inspire others to join them. So what does it take to be a champion? The ability to articulate shared benefits and goals may be one of the most important characteristics, leadership characteristics and skills of a champion. Champions must be able to simultaneously envision the results of their collaboration, along with addressing the concerns of their partners throughout the process. When it comes to water recycling and water reuse, champions may be driven by their desire to innovate, to achieve sustainability, and even to promote environmental justice. They galvanize their peers around shared purposes and catalyze change across utility and agency service areas. Ribbon cuttings, groundbreakings, intergovernmental agreements. These are all the results of champions who have been able to inspire others to join them in leading their organizations. Champions are at the heart of interagency collaboration and we can learn from observing how they get things done how they achieve future work toward a future that is more resilient, sustainable, and ultimately in, embraces water reuse. Next slide, please. In summary, even at this early stage of our study, we can make a few observations and I'm going to highlight five of these for you. The first one is, it is never too early for agencies to begin working together. A history of cooperation makes a solid foundation for future collaboration. The second observation, agencies can often meet environmental regulations more effectively by working together and solving multiple problems to, wa to reuse water. Number three, agencies must consider economic benefits broadly, including avoided costs and risk reduction to appreciate the value of water reuse and to ensure that the beneficiary pays. Number four, agencies can successfully uh, can allocate roles and responsibilities by carefully identifying operations and maintenance tasks. And finally, number five, leadership has many different drivers and champions are most effective when their leadership qualities are valued by their partner agencies and their organizations. Next slide, please. Finally, we would like to acknowledge our team member, Dr. Bauman Sheikh. He, he recently passed away and was a true global pioneer in water reuse and water recycling. He is fondly remembered by his colleagues for his knowledge but also for his kindness and his generosity of spirit. We dedicate this presentation to him. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention. And with that, I will hand it back over to our moderator, Diane Diaris. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, and I, I will start by, uh, we, now we have open questions. Thank you for, for controlling time. You're, we are perfectly in time. Probably we'll start by the last presentation. <laughs> you have been the last, so I start with the question to you. You have shown very well how it's complex uh, to work together. Uh, and also very interesting to see the different level of agency, the organization and, and so. So in a certain way, you, you show the difficulties, but what could be the reason for the agency to, to work together? What, what can be the motivation except to be a champion? Where do you find a way of uh, having a reason for them to be more uh, actively working together? What, what are your uh, uh, way to solve that and, and help them to work together? Well, have you some, uh, some clue or some ideas on, on the way it can work? Eric and Shannon, I don't know. <laughs> Let me you know, take a crack at, at uh, answering that and then Shannon, you can add anything that you think might be appropriate. Um, given the changing climate, and the challenges of water supply, 
in the future. I think many agencies see recycled water as a, a, a locally controllable supply, one that is more resilient to drought and uh, capable of um, supplying water in changing conditions in the future. In California, for example, the snowpack is decreasing radically. So the storage of water in the mountains is much less reliable than it used to be. So many California agencies are using water, are reusing water now as a, a hedge against future change. Shannon, your thoughts? Yeah. Yes, I also think one of the primary drivers is um, something Eric highlighted in one of his slides, the idea that we can do more when we work together. We can have greater impact. We can stretch our resources further. And he actually gave a very um, concrete example of when two agencies work together, together, they were able to achieve their outcomes and desired goals for half the financial cost as it would have been had they independently tackled their problems. Um, maybe um, I'm going to ask a question to Rai now again. Um, is there a competition with, between um, green infrastructure and gray infrastructure? How do you see that? Because some, sometimes people are competing, they have technology. Or on the contrary, you feel that they, are, they can work really together, there is a place for both of them. How do you feel uh, the, the way and how do, what is in the place to the uh, green infrastructure in the future? How well, do you see that? Uh, there's definitely uh, some competition, not that they mean to compete, uh, but uh, you have a vast, vast amount of the gray the infrastructure, the concrete, the steel, uh, et cetera, and green infrastructure in scale is typically much smaller. However, I think the key will be if they can access the same funding resources and a little bit uh, of progress is being made right now because a lot of the laws now that fund the government funding of gray infrastructure is requiring that certain uh, certain green infrastructure be integrated uh, with the gray infrastructure. So they're making uh, some headway um, and uh, the uh, uh, there's just more to be done uh, as green infrastructure moves more into flood control from water quality, there'll be new types of funding challenges for that. Um, a question maybe to Eric. Uh, people were interested to see your experience in Africa, but are you working in other parts of the world, Persian Gulf or things like that, or do you concentrate on uh, Africa and, and uh, or could you do that? Is it uh, what you have done in, uh, in Sahel could be a, uh, used and adapt in other regions of the world? Emmanuel? Well, I'm sorry, I said Eric, but I, I thought, uh, yeah, Eric, yeah. So uh, it's interesting you should ask that. Um, my own work is, is uh, with respect to water recycling, is mostly focused in the United States and in fact, the Western part of the United States. Uh, but our dear colleague, Bachman Sheikh, was very active in developing reuse programs throughout the Middle East and Africa. He developed um, uh, uh, master plans for water recycling in Tunis, in, in Tunisia, as well yeah. as in uh, uh, Jordan and in Egypt. And I know there's been a tremendous amount of work done all through the, the Middle East, both in Israel and in Jordan, Egypt and Saudi Arabia. In fact, uh, uh, Bachman uh, returned to Iran for the first time in some 40 years uh, just last year to, uh, to lecture on water recycling there. So I think you're seeing an increased interest in water reuse most everywhere. Also to, to plug our book beyond uh, in the, the industrial sector, there's also tremendous interest in industrial water reuse. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, maybe to Emmanuel, a question to Emmanuel, which uh, raised, um, do you think that the state of heart of information technology has reached a sufficient level of maturity to effectively integrate all existing database and enhance transparency and, and contribute to decision making. Sometimes it's very complex and database are complicated. We have to do data mining. So what is your vision on the level of maturity of the uh, IT uh, technology in order to help? Because you, you experiment that. So what is your vision on oh, that? Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. Yes, I think and I just want to say, by the way, I want to salute my American colleagues, which is uh, taking breakfast. And I know it's <laughs> difficult for them to wake up. So I forgot to salute them. But I um, strike and I, 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 um, the answer will yes to your will echo what you Jan. Just a question. We all speak, spoke in our intervention about governance, about uh, change, about interpersonal forward thinking. And also the experience as a flyer, I was a jet fighter pilot, but I know the technology, sometimes the process and the technology will force you to collaborate more. And the issue is to think as you have now, we have the tools, we just have to decide it. And also to um, let's embark on a better cooperation. We have to take account that nowadays there is no sufficient cooperation based too much stovepipe. So let's use the technology and the, 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 the tools to cooperate more. After, yes, there will be retention of information, but uh, surely there is a lot of potential and you need to accept to, to trigger a system of cooperation will attract cooperation. That's my point. And to echo what uh, Ray, you asked a question, Diana, about Ray or to Shannon, what was the interest of cooperation? You raise the point, you need to raise the point where it's in our interest to cooperate instead of restraining information. This is absolutely key now. And, and now every people we are working, but where I'm insisting on, it's not a question of using the technology. It's a question of spirit of mind, of ability to think the complex system to use in, I work in the, I, uh, the system of information communication system, uh, operational system, and I, I realize that the most difficult job is to be an architect, to be an engineer, to speak of, about, to conceive the system and to conceive cooperation. And you can do it. And the question of the world I use is to be an helicopter and to work with indirect connection or a direct connection to have clearing hours. So there is a lot of mechanisms that we need to think and even to connect uh, organization which are not under the same hierarchy on a chain of chain, I will argue, I will use a, a military world, world, the chain of command. So the key thing is to reorganize things and to have a better view. But let's look at that and admit that from a, I jump in the, in the world of water and I met you down uh, three years ago because I'm newcomer in, 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 in the water business. But, but my point is it's very complex. It's very complex, very lot of stovepipe. So my point is you need to simplify it and accept the world to simplify it and to put more transparency. So yes, it, it, to answer to your echo to your question, it is possible, and also it is uh, very important to um, focus at the service of the people who are going to decide. Let's be frank: the Ministry of Hydro Hydraulic, or in Mauritania, or in other countries, or in Sahel, they don't have the tools and they don't have the information, relevant information to, to make the proper decision. So, it should be embracing a lot of of, uh, of discipline, and I think this time of has come. Uh, we all teach now from a different convergence. Where you, I, I know your Finland is very uh, uh, focusing on converging discipline. I think this time has come and water could be uh, giving a, a tremendous example where we need to cooperate more and mix and break and mix our views and mix our expertise. And this is personally the bet I've done with more water for sale is bringing the kind of expertise and having that. So yes, the answer is definitely yes. Um, I would like probably to give um, uh, a remark. Uh, in IWA, we are mainly focusing on this small cycle of water. And we, we had people, we were local, distributing water, treating wastewater. It seems that the small cycle, the water cycle, but the small one at the level of the urban is now connecting much more than before with the big water cycle. And that we can't stay at our small cycle. We need to keep that because as Eric was uh, in charge of, of, of a treatment, you need to keep your business uh, and local and so on. But it seems that the size is growing and we can't keep on being just a professional of the small cycle. We need to have a, a broader vision and exchange. And it's what more or less you all have uh, described. The innovation go by a, a bigger vision and exchanging with uh, people with organization with the global cycle not we can't stay on our small scale we need to have a grow growing cooperation which maybe technology can help but uh, it's it's quite challenging 
to be uh, to be uh, going from the micro management to the macro management. So, what is your reaction, Eric, on that? And, and Shannon and Rai and and, and Emmanuel, I think, is it? Are we changing the size of the water perspective? So I'll I'll just say that that the issue of scale and scope is becoming more and more uh, uh, an area of study of very of concern. So my experience, I was managing a 600 million cubic meter per day uh, treatment plant, uh, 160 million gallons per day, and but now we see and we and we recycled uh, uh, probably 30 million gallons a day. So that's what 120 million cubic meters per day. Um, but at the same time, we see in the San Francisco Bay Area a real interest in building scale reuse now, where wastewater treatment plants are actually built in the basements of buildings and, and treat water for reuse within those buildings. So somewhere between the regional plants and the building scale plants, I think we're going to see a profusion of neighborhood cluster scale treatment and reuse to take the best advantage of our resource use to find the most economical way to do that. And I'll yield to the other panelists on this. Yeah, I have, a, 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 you know, I agree with that. I think uh, what's at the heart of all of this uh, adapting to scale and, and, and uh, competition and whatever is human behavior. It's, uh, we're going to have to get a lot of public acceptance. Uh, we were obviously uh, getting ahead on that uh, with reuse green infrastructure is uh, nice, but if uh, you get a NIMBY situation, people may not want it on their land, even though they get a lot of the benefits, the view, the, the aesthetics uh, and so forth, but that's going to be a big job is, is uh, public behavior, Except perception, attitudes. Yeah. yeah, I remember a study in Australia where the people were asking, are you ready to drink? reuse water <laughs> and they were on swearing yes if it is my water that's, that's i drink my water but not the, the the neighbor okay but on the other hand don't you think that the uh, younger generation uh, rather our at least my kids and things like that are much more open to that uh, cooperation and, and behavior they are more understanding yes. the global vision what is your vision on on the next generation the young professional yeah again a lot of the surveys i've seen have shown that they're more accepting but that's not to say that the elder you know the older generations aren't also you know they have uh, finished with their work they're beginning to enjoy life and they they want to put this forward also yeah that's true yeah yeah mm -hmm. Okay, is there uh, some other uh, we remark? Maybe well, last may, last remark, <laughs> Emmanuel. May, yeah. may, maybe maybe the question is also the question of reorganizing the uh, we say the, the word market, but it's important mm. the economy. So the question now nowadays the way we cooperate is structured in a way that it's is pushing towards compartmentalization, and I'm referring to mm. science. So I think uh, we need if we want to put science first and science at the bottom we need to uh, also rethink yes it should be a i would say profitably it's a question but um, the question of water and jurisdiction so i think there is a lot of issues and also to to say that uh, you or uh, what you said about the complexity yes there is complexity in in, in managing uh, new actors and it's complex but at the, at the end you will gain and everyone will gain, but in the question of reward should be asked, uh, uh, maybe uh, we forgot some time to focus on who are the beneficiary, the, um, the, uh, the people who benefit from our airports. So it's a population and I'm afraid sometimes uh, we focus not enough on the people which are at the end of the chain. So we, maybe we need to, to rethink and also it's the reason why I insist on being uh, tactical and strategic, what I say, the helicopter. So you need to be able to go on high conference level, but also have the, the, uh, the concern to deserve and give the proper answers to the people. So, but the paradox today is, is incredible because today there is groundwater 
100 meters, 40 meters, 40 meters below people which are suffering, which are under the minimum of the, uh, of the World AIDS Organization. So very something to be done. So we need to think it collectively. So that's, that's the door that we open here. Yeah, okay. Eric, maybe a last remark and then Shannon um, on, the, on the topics. Well, you asked a question before about the younger generation, and we only have one person on our panel who fits that profile. So I'm going to give cede my time to Christiana to see if she has a uh, comment. Now about this young generation, your willingness to do things differently or take responsibility for the water cycle in ways that the older generation just wanted to turn on the tap and flush the toilet and perhaps your generation may be more involved in, in its water cycle. Well, uh, I do think from my experience that it depends uh, which, within which culture, uh, about which culture we are talking about. So in the Western world, we are going towards the green direction. So we are going to be more aware, more accepting. But I just studied, for example, the Persian Gulf, and there is much resistance on uh, technology and acceptance on uh, green technologies, I would say. There is still this resistance, but they are trying to, to push, but that is more from a top down approach and bringing technology and opening to new markets and new ideas from the external world. Otherwise, the world is very much more limited, in a, in a way, more isolated. Um, so, this is what I realized. It depends which culture we are talking about. And then there are different approaches how to. Uh, convince, let's say convince, uh, how to make uh, these new approaches uh, feasible or accepted by, uh, by the young generation or in general from, uh, from the population. And that is much a, a strategy that we observed in a certain way in the Western world and in another way in, uh, let's say, Muslim countries or uh, di dictatorial countries. It depends. So we have different approaches. This is very fascinating. I guess uh, a social uh, a social advisor can explain this uh, system better. Uh, but this is what I. This is my experience. So it depends really which uh, which region we are tackling and what is the culture. And as UNESCO, you need to be aware about the culture of these people and to understand how you can bring in a positive way and to get this acceptance in a non uh, in a, in a non aggressive way and so that we have uh, we can have long lasting uh, results on that i cannot hear you yeah i forgot to <laughs> yeah what is sure is that being a professional in the water business in the of the in the future will be quite different from what we have been experiencing in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. I mean, it's a, it's a different world, it's different technology, and, and there will be much more uh, different culture, different knowledge. You have now urbanist, you have economist, you have your economy, it has been uh, shown by, uh, uh, by Eric, is very important. In the past, water was just engineer technology. I mean, and, and, and you were building pipes and things. Now it's, it's much more stakeholder governance, Human, human culture, so water is changing in that side and, and we need to take care of that. Okay, I think we have now uh, reached the time we have to, to, to finish. So I will really thank you for your, uh, for your presentation. Remind everybody that you have given very good paper. So every presentation was short. It has to be, but when you read the different papers, you have much more information. So I push uh, all people to uh, to have a look on what has been also uh, on the papers and maybe on, on the books for those who are going to edit new books. And thank you for, for being, and I, I leave now the organization to take the lead again. Thank you for so much. Chers orateurs, oratrices, auditeurs et auditrices, 
Nous vous remercions. Dear speakers, uh, dear participants, thank you for participating in this third day of uh, the Water Megacities and Global Change pre-conference. We will meet tomorrow at 1 p.m. Paris time for two other sessions. Thank you.